to introduce our speaker for the night, Professor Brian J. Ford, a man full of insight. His work is varied, to say the least, from headlights to plants and unavoidably yeast. A terrific <laughs> microbiologist of such high acclaim, featuring on the BBC in his claim to fame. A writer, author and popular speaker too, he's now going to impart his pearls of wisdom on you. But before he does, I propose a toast to Keys Natsky Society, the society I love most. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, the time has now come when we must make amends. <laughs> I think you agree that it is high time that we dispense with this nonsense and stop speaking in rhyme. <laughs> uh, Your Majesty, or Royal Highness, my Lords, Fellows of the College, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if there's anybody posh here, but it's just as well to be safe. <laughs> to pay a tribute to Catherine, our president. When she came in, the financial subvention made to this great Nasky society was a paltry 60 quid, less than 100 bucks, a ridiculous, miser, miserly, miserly sum of money. And Catherine took on the authorities and raised it to 250 pounds. <laughs> Not many people can do that in these, these difficult times. And Catherine did it. She deserves Yay. our support and our acclaim <laughs> and recognition. Well done. Yay. Now, she invited me to come and speak to you at this auspicious dinner. Not easy to say when you're drunk. And, <laughs> and the invitation came about three weeks ago, which was very gratifying, a great honour, a great pleasure. But when an invitation comes three weeks before a dinner, it means only one thing, and that is they've been scrambling around like mad to find somebody to speak, <laughs> and nobody else would come. <laughs> so I hacked across to her tweets, and I discovered that indeed she'd asked Jimmy Carr <laughs> if he'd like to be a speaker. <laughs> and eventually, when she couldn't get what she wanted, she settled for me. It's a bit like the story of life, ladies and gentlemen. You want a prestigious car, and you end up with a Ford. <laughs> now, I've been given many hints as to how to do an after speak dinner speech over the years. Uh, Arthur Askey, a great comic that some of your great grandparents will remember, once said to me, he said, the only important thing when you give a speech is to make sure you've remembered to zip up your trousers. And, <laughs> and I may say that's true. More than once I have sat in a room and seen an inebriated speaker, obviously pleased with what he was saying, he was the only one in the room who was, <laughs> with a, a greying tuft of unsavoury underwear displayed where it really should be. <laughs> I may say that other advice I was given was by a, a wonderful writer who said to me, he said, there are three rules for giving an afternoon speech. The first is to have an amusing beginning. The second is to have a memorable conclusion. And the third rule, which is far and away the most important, is to keep them both really close together. <laughs> <laughs> now, I sought opinions as to what I might say to you all this week, <coughs> And my script has been mostly written by the chums with whom I'm seated this evening, not that they're going to get any credit for it by name, but, but a number of people dealt me advice. Uh, nobody turned out quite to be the ace, though one did turn out to be the king. And um, I felt, therefore, that the appropriate thing to do, uh, in the light of what I was encouraged to speak about, was to tell you something about my life in science. Now, this is going to be a crap speech. I've never spoken about my life in science before. I don't propose to do so again. And thus, it is extemporised and ill thought out, indeed, largely non thought out. And I apologise in advance for how bad it's likely to be. But I couldn't grasp what society thought was the purpose of science when I was a lad. I mean, I went to school and they said to me, uh, we're going to learn mimicry 
in, um, in butterflies, and here's the peacock butterfly. It has eye markings on its wings. This is when I was nine at, at Ladbrook Primary School in Potter's Bar. And the teacher, Miss Horroy, said to me, the reason that the peacock butterfly has eye markings on its wings is because it will prevent it dying. If a bird comes along to attack it, the bird will peck at the eye markings, mistaking them for the body of the butterfly, and therefore the butterfly escapes being pecked to death. And I said, well, that makes no sense at all. And she said, why? I said, because, firstly, I've seen hundreds of peacock butterflies, and I've never seen one with beak marks on its wings. And secondly, because if it was pecked, it wouldn't be able to fly anyway, and thus it would be doomed to a painful death. It makes no sense. She would say, Brian, it's in the book. <laughs> Just learn it for the exam. <laughs> and next week we came to protective mechanisms in the ecological cycle of life. And she said, thistles have leaves covered with prickles. And the reason they're covered with prickles is because it stops them from being eaten by animals. Because if they were eaten, they would become extinct. And that is how they survive. And I said, but that makes no sense at all. And she said, oh, God, what now, Brian? And I said, because on my uncle's farm, all the animals love to eat thistles, the donkeys and the goats in particular. Whereas the common plants like daisies and buttercups and dandelions and grass have no prickles. If what you say is true, they would all be extinct millions of years ago. And she said, Brian, these people in the book, they know what they're writing. <laughs> you have to learn it for the exams. And, and so as I went through junior school, I began to form the view that Essentially, we were being taught stuff just to pass exams. We weren't being taught what we needed. And of course, when I went on into the senior school, I was at the King's School in Peterborough, it got even worse. Because they didn't teach you the stuff you wanted to know, like how to book a cheap holiday, how to make videos, you know, all the sort of how to produce music tracks, all the kind of stuff you wanted to know, none of it was there. And people said, this is because we've had to reorganize the way in which we, we codify a syllabus. Because these days, kids don't like to learn stuff by rote, they, and they don't want to understand the, the literary nuances of people like Shakespeare. And I thought, this is all wrong. Of course kids do. I mean, if, if Adele, the, the stout singer, <laughs> <laughs> Shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> Whom I've heard is due to take five years off, but now says she isn't. But if she has a new single app, everybody knows the lyric within minutes. Of course people like learning stuff by rote. If you look in, in pubs, the, the machines that have become increasingly popular in recent years are all the quiz machines. Because if they're not being given exams in school, they'll find exams somewhere else. The, these, these word puzzle books sell like never before. Because nobody's stretching your brains in school, so you have to get your brain stretched somewhere else. What educationists don't understand, ladies and gentlemen, is that kids have an imperative, an urge, an overwhelming desire to have their intellect stressed and to learn stuff. If you don't teach it in school, they'll do it somewhere else. They'll often learn the wrong kind of thing. <laughs> now, I came to feel that science wasn't represented right in school. There is an understanding, wherever you look in science, that you have to go to university, as you have all done. Uh, you then do a, a fine degree. And after that, you're qualified to become some sort of academic and do research work. Now, this simply isn't true. In fact, I wonder why most of you are here. I'll, I'll tell you why you're here in a moment. But if you look back at the history of science, you realize that most of the great innovations, most of the stuff you get taught by academics when you are students, was done by rebels, by outsiders, by unqualified persons, by people who were beyond the pale of the establishment. Leeuwenhoek, the first microbiologist, was a draper. Dunlop, who invented tyres, was a vet. Byro, who gave us the ballpoint pen, was a sculptor. Pasteur, the microbiologist, was a chemist. Wherever you look, you see these things. And don't just think, as I can see some of you wisely already are, ah, but that's historical, it's not that way now. Of course it is. Clive Sinclair, who gave us the laptop, never went to university. Steve Jobs, 
who recently died of pancreatic cancer, and Bill Gates, who is trying to prevent people dying of malaria, neither of them completed their degrees. The great innovators in society never did do the orthodox thing. I was once asked, when dining here at my table, I was once asked by an academic from Oxford, he said, you didn't do your degree, did you? And I said, no. I thought science was going the wrong way. So when I was an undergraduate, I left university and set up my own lab to do it differently. And he said, so how do you feel when you look around a room full of Cambridge graduates? How now, he said, do you look at a Cambridge degree? Now, I was drunk, or I wouldn't have said anything quite so good. <laughs> but I said to him, I think it's a jolly useful thing to have for anybody who lacks the ability to succeed without one. <laughs> now, I can tell you why you're here at university. It's because you want to get pissed, you want to get laid, you want to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> going to university is the only way of going to bed late without having your parents banging on the wall and saying, why have you got to bed late? <laughs> if you were to say to your parents, I'm going to go to Cambridge and study something and I've got a bed and breakfast, they would weepingly get on the phone to your aunt and they would say, they're going to leave home. What have we done to a If you say, however, I'm going to university, they'll run around and say, oh, goodness, they're going to Cambridge. <laughs> the reason that you go to university, ladies and gentlemen, is because it's the best and most painless way there is of leaving home. <laughs> <laughs> what you learn in university will have negligible relevance to what you need in the outside world. I can assure you of that. Now, I had a year out before I went to university. I had a year at the Medical Research Council as a research assistant in the most junior and insignificant capacity you can possibly imagine. I was also playing keyboards in a rock and roll band, and I'd been to see the editor of the local paper and said, what you need is a science column, and he'd benevolently agreed. So before I was a student, I mean, I knew many of the people at the university, which gave me an entire social circle of its own, I knew people at the Medical Research Council where I was doing research, and, and so that was another social set. I knew people who were writers, including people like um, Sue Lawley and Michael Burke and John Humphreys, who were contemporaries of mine, and so I had that social circle as well. And then I had a rock and roll circle. <laughs> so when I went to university and I had to sort of settle down to be a student, God, it seemed so humdrum. The lives you lead, they're so con cons conscripted, they're so, so delineated, they're so bubble-like, they're so inured with isolation from the real world. And I was having parties galore. I had friends in all sorts of different dimensions. And so I thought, what I'll do is leave, leave university and set up my own lab. Now, I don't want any of you to be encouraged by what I have said, because <laughs> it was not a sensible thing to do. It was the most fundamentally irresponsible, thoughtless, self-indulgent and arrogant thing you could imagine. It happens to have worked, but it shouldn't have done in any way at all. Uh, now, of course, having always worked with the light microscope, and we're told this every week by somebody, try it, because it always amuses me like mad. If you go to Google and you type the words microscope research into Google and hit enter, and you get 45 million sites in the world, and my humble little site comes in top out of all of those. Now, I have no idea how that works. I claim no credit for it. But it does show that if you are single-minded enough to do things, that it can work out in the end. And what I want to say to you all is this. Please, whatever you do, rebel. Most of you are concerned with the notion of getting a job in a bank or some crappy thing like that and making a lot of money. Money doesn't give you what you want. What you want is to be intelligent, humorous, witty, to have a good memory, to have perfect pitch, any of those things. <laughs> and money doesn't buy you the things you want. If ever money is not in your top ten of the criteria by which you make a decision in life, you're wrong. But if ever it's number one in your list, you're even more wrong. Believe me, money does not matter. You need enough to buy your home and to live a reasonable life. But what you want, ladies and gentlemen, is fun. 
You don't want to be betokened to the bankers, administrators and to the company. Don't think, where can I earn most money? Think, where can I have most enjoyment and put most into life? That really, above all, is what really matters. Now, I have a position as an arch rebel in science. A complete non-conformist. I wanted to do science in a different way, and I'm pleased to say that I have. Of course, you need a support system. You need, you need an administrator, a secretary, an accountant, an advisor, and indeed I do have these facilities, and she's sitting here by me <laughs> as I speak. <laughs> I would also say, I would also say that this college, I mean I've been a member of the senior common room here for what, eight years, I suppose, and I rarely had more interesting conversations or a more warm welcome. And that's the important thing. If you're a genuine rebel, Keys will welcome you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't feel that you're stamping onto it. Yes, 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 you have to stand on that escalator as you get to the top. Nobody's saying you don't. But believe me, ladies and gentlemen, if, if an innovative course in science, if a rebellious way ahead is what you want, then, honestly, Keys is the college for you. Thank you very much.